is a very uh, difficult sport, if you will. It has its ups and downs, wins and losses. Well, my next four guests, they know exactly what that is like, but they also have a very unique perspective, being four black women, being at the center of democratic politics uh, over the last uh, 30 some odd years. Many of them started very young, and of course now they are I won't call them seasoned uh, saints, but uh, they have been, that, that's what we call them in the church. Uh, as folks get older, they're still involved in politics, uh, and they have a very unique story. Uh, and a new book is out, of course, that details their story. Uh, and it's called For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Politics. And of course, of course the four of them uh, uh, joined us right now, Donna Brazil, she's a political analyst, also former chair of the Democratic National Committee. Yolanda Caraway is the founder and CEO of the consulting group, the Caraway Group. Also, Leah Daughtry, a political activist and former chair and CEO of the Democratic National Convention. And Mignon Moore, one of the founders of Women Building for the Future. She has the local and state practices for the Dewey Square Group. They join us all right now. How y'all doing? Hey, Great. Hey, hey, man. Hey, Roland. So first of all, yes. How you doing? Uh, I'm good here in New York. I uh, was in LA yesterday, uh, and so traveling like crazy, but uh, glad to have uh, y'all here to talk about uh, your new book, uh, to talk about some of these stories. But the first thing I gotta ask, uh, wh who came up with th the title of y'all group for Colored Girls? Well, it, it goes back to our period of time uh, in the Dukakis campaign in 1988. Mignon and I were both uh, involved in that campaign, and there was an incident uh, where the senior leadership of the campaign decided to move on one floor, uh, which left many of the other staffers, including Mignon and I, on a different floor. That evening, after cocktail hour, we went up to the quote unquote, the upper chamber and decided to uh, turn a, a very important conference room into a meeting room and we called it for color girls. And underneath we said, we shall not be moved. So uh, that's how it began and, and the rest, uh, as they say, is a little bit of uh, recent history as well. I can hear him. Did I lose him? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Well, I, look, I, I think this, this is um, one of those moments where mm -hmm. we, we understand the importance of black women. Black women are breaking barriers at all levels of American politics. Stacey Abrams, who is poised to become the first African-American ever to, to win a gubernatorial seat. So we're excited about this political uh, year that we're about to embark upon. But more importantly, as Mignon will, will tell you, or Leah, or Yolanda, uh, we're excited that in addition to black women running, black women are voting at record levels across the country. So here's the question I have. So who 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 came in first? And so you know, the four of you, so who came into uh, the DNC first and then how did the other the rest of you then matriculate and then how did y'all friendship form? Give us I, the backstory. I was the first one to work at the DNC in the 1980s. I worked for Congress, then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski and um, her chief of staff, Ann Lewis, was offered a job as political director for the DNC um, after, right after Jimmy Carter lost. Uh, and she took me over there with her. So that was how I got to the DNC. But before I got to the DNC, when I was working for Congresswoman Mikulski, I had a very low-level job. And it was really funny, one day somebody came in and said, well, there's a lady out here. Would you, would you mind coming to meet with her? And I couldn't figure out why they were asking me to meet with her. So I went out, and it was Donna. <laughs> 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 then I said, OK, that's it. I get it now. <laughs> but we became fast friends after that, and then the rest of us met along the way. So Mignon and Leah, uh, mm -hmm. how did the two of you then become uh, involved with the DNC? Well, I first came to the DNC after uh, I'd been on Capitol Hill for four years working for my hometown congressman, Ed Towns. And I left uh, the Hill to go to work for Yolanda at the DNC to uh, help with the site selection for the 1992 convention. Uh, I knew of Yolanda and Donna and Mignon because we were all uh, connected through the Jackson campaign. And so my father, who was intimately involved with uh, Reverend Jackson's campaign, 
told me about them. So I had some familiarity, at least with their names and with their work, because I would, they were held up to me as, as women that I needed to connect with and I needed to uh, follow along as I was building my own career. Mignon? I came in under the first Clinton administration. Um, I was actually working for the Rainbow Coalition, and when President Clinton was elected, David Wilhelm was the chair of the party, and he requested from Reverend Jackson, uh, he requested, and that's a different kind of hire, he requested that I come to the DNC mm -hmm. because I had, you know, I had done so much work uh, during the Clinton campaign. So I went to the, that's how I came to the DNC. And then I did a number of different jobs and ultimately I ended up at the White House. Uh, I have explained to people on many occasions that when we are talking about democratic politics over the last 30, 40 years, that there has been no greater figure, specifically when it comes to black folks, uh, than Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. Uh, you could, uh, first of all, of course, uh, you can say in the in the early 70s, it was Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. She decides yeah. to run for president. Then, of course, then you go into the 80s. Those two runs in 84 and 88, not only did they change, uh, change the face of the party and the issues, but also, as several of you already said, it was Reverend Jackson who brought in this whole new wave of young black men, black women, mm -hmm. uh, folks uh, who otherwise did not get a shot, uh, but also uh, very progressive white folks uh, mm -hmm. who also uh, had an opportunity to run state campaigns, former Senator Paul Wellstone. So talk about, again, how vital Reverend Jackson was to your careers and also advancing the interests of black folks on the, in the Democratic Party. I, I got involved in the Jackson campaign in November of 1983 when Reverend Jackson decided to run for president. It was a historic time coming off the uh, win by Harold Washington in the city of Chicago. Mignon is familiar with that campaign. Reverend Jackson uh, not only competed in all 50 states, but he won delegates. As a result of that historic campaign where we registered new voters, Reverend Jackson was able to change the rules of the Democratic Party, open up the process to previously denied denied uh, individuals to serve. But I want to say uh, on a personal note, and I think we all can attest to this, Reverend Jackson gave us not just a seat at the table, but he made us players. Uh, and I, I, I am, uh, uh, to this day, I am, I am forever uh, grateful for his leadership, uh, his mentorship, but more importantly, his ability to uh, recognize that young African Americans, young, young Hispanics, young uh, openly gays and lesbians, and everyone else, Reverend saw the rainbow before we understood uh, we could get there. I went to um, work for Reverend Jackson from the DNC after I had managed the uh, what was called the Fairness Commission, which was the Rules Commission for the next uh, presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I think that they lacked in 84 was they didn't really understand party politics. They didn't understand the rules. So he was determined this time to bring in people who knew how to deal with all of this. And it made such a huge difference. I mean, you know, Jesse, you look back and he, he almost won. <laughs> you know, when we got to Michigan, he won Michigan. We were, we were saying, oh my goodness, we might really win this thing. <laughs> and I, th I think the other key thing about Reverend Jackson's campaign, besides that he opened the doors and allowed more people to come in, as he called it, democratizing the democracy. Mm -hmm. But he paid attention to the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to tell us that you gotta know the rules in right. order to know how to change mm -hmm. the rules. And through his campaign, candidacy, he changed the fundamental way that the Democratic Party functioned. Mm -hmm. He's the reason that we don't have win or take all That's right. yeah, primaries right. anymore. He's the reason that we had, we strengthened the numbers of African Americans and people of color as superdelegates. Right. That was Reverend Jackson who insisted after his success in his campaigns that the party had to change the way that it did its regular business, the business of electing a president. And he doesn't get as much of the credit as he should but really, today's candidates run on the basis and on the foundation of the rules that Reverend Jackson changed inside the party. Well, I, I had to explain to people that the reality is, if you study the 2008 election, if the 2008 election was under the old rules, Hillary Clinton is a Democratic nominee mm -hmm. because 
She won, uh, she won New Hampshire. She then won Nevada. She won the major states like Texas, California, Pennsylvania, Ohio. and Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so under the old rules, winner take all, uh, she would have taken all of those delegates and that would have been a huge momentum for her to be able to win the nomination. And so I tell folks all the time, you can be excited that President Barack Obama became the first black president, but if Reverend Jackson and Dr. Ron Walters and Ron Brown, if they don't change those rules in mm -hmm. 1988, mm -hmm. there is no Obama presidency in 2008. That's correct. That's, Speak, correct. that's absolutely correct, Roland, because I was actually on the 88 campaign and now that I am off the campaign and I am on the rules committee at the DNC, you understand just how critical changing those rules have become to the party and to changing the face of the party. I mean, you're absolutely correct when you say there would not have been a nomination for Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton for that matter, because we can't compete at that level. Women can't compete at that level. And I think that, you know, history will write this story, I think, very favorably for him. Even though we have young people that weren't even born when Reverend Jackson ran in 94 and 98, so, I mean, in 84 and 88, and they have no concept or clue as to what he did. Not only did he usher in a new set of rules, he also ushered in a new set of African-American, Latino, women, as Donna said, politicians. So I think that, you know, we still see the remnants of his work, and hopefully it will, it will go on for a couple of other decades. You know, Roland, Crazy. after the after that ahead, 19, ahead, ahead. after that ahead, 98, uh, 1998 campaign, 88. eight. I'm sorry, 1988 campaign. There were um, we had almost a, a black mayor in almost every urban city. We had more p black people running for office. That and you know, and I know I spoke personally to some of them. And the late Bill Gray said on the floor of the convention in 1984. I'm going to run for budget chair. Mm -hmm. And that's something that had never been done. But he said, if Jesse can do this, I can do that. And a whole lot of people said that. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget Fannie Lou Hamer, who in 1964 insisted on having the Mississippi delegation uh, uh, have a seat at the table. There, there are so many men and women who uh, dared to make a difference inside the Democratic Party. But Jesse Jackson clearly, in the last 30 years, opened it up, made it a more Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. and and gave so many people a seat at the table. Got to ask y'all this. I mean, clearly politics is a rough and tumble sport. Uh, and so um, give me an example where y'all had to get real color. <laughs> and y'all had, had to let some white folks in the Democratic Party know, no. <laughs> How much oh, time you have? Yeah, yeah, don't right. We, we right. just had it two weeks ago. Now. <laughs> two weeks ago. We, 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 we will always stand up. Yeah. But yeah uh, There's no. <laughs> Yolanda I have an example. I, yeah, I have an example. Um, in the Virginia primaries, we technically won the most delegates. Uh, but the white state chair wanted to be the head of the delegation. And, you know, I had worked for the DNC, so everybody knew me, and now I was working for Jesse, so I, uh, in another hat. He wanted to be the head of the delegation so badly, but we would not say, hey, we won. Mm -hmm. It's ours. We're going to be the head of the delegation. Well, well, well and speaking of Virginia, I mean, when uh, the lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, they right. wanted him to sign a piece of paper saying that he would not run again. They wouldn't put his name right. on the flyers. And we protested that. We have never been uh, what we you would call the silent uh, troopers. We have been the political warriors mm -hmm. uh, and people who cared to make a difference. We have we believe in service and we believe in our people and the cause of justice and equality for all. Uh, I'll take, we believe in disturbing the comfortable. That's what we believe. That's true, <laughs> yes. And I'll give you an example from when Ron Brown was chair. Uh, we had some state party chairs who were not happy mm -hmm. that a black man was the chair of the Democratic National Committee. And there was one in particular, and I talk about it in the book, the state chair of Alabama, who told Ron Brown he was not welcome in the state of Alabama, which of course meant that we were going to Alabama in, and having a fundraiser mm -hmm. anyway. And we did that. <laughs> we had to find someone who was both 
bold enough to host it. And I was responsible for putting that fundraiser together. And in the end, we exceeded our goals. Ron Brown came in there uh, like, like Grant went through Richmond. <laughs> and uh, we had a wonderful fundraiser. And at the end, the state party chair of Alabama rolled himself up to the, to the, to the site and asked for admittance. And I told the chair, what do you want to do? He said, let him in. And we let him in. And Ron Brown was very gracious. But we never had any more trouble out of the state chairs after that incident. Uh, a former so, chair decided that they wanted to put on a quote unquote uh, a, a staff list uh, uh, and we saw that it included only black staffers and we protested that and we saved their jobs. So it, whether it's in the political realm when people are running for office or internally with the staff at the DNC, we care about the party, we care about democracy and we care about our country. 2004, Senator John Kerry, he is the Democratic nominee. And my understanding is that, um, now this probably might get a little messy here for, uh -oh. in the black people space, <laughs> okay. that uh, he had decided that he was going uh, to choose Kwesi Mfume to give the keynote address, this major, major speech. And of course, Kwesi Mfume was going to launch his Senate bid from Maryland. And I understand that four colored women Oh. Went to John Kerry and said, you know what, you really ought to pick this guy out of Illinois to give that keynote speech. That True was a uh, Mignon can probably attest to that because I, I credit Mignon with uh, introducing us to Barack Obama. Uh, and I and I guess she might credit Hillary Clinton of introducing her to Barack Obama. But she's from Illinois. So I'll pass the mic to Mignon. Well, I don't want uh, you to believe that it was Kwesi versus Barack Obama. In fact, the story is actually a little bit different. In fact, they were looking for someone that would not actually agitate the CBC. They could, I mean, you could pick a Kwesi and he would have been fabulous, but then you could have picked any number of the Congressional Black Caucus members. So we came up with, well, you know, he's going to be the next senator, the first, I mean, we hadn't had a senator in a long time. Since and, Carol. Yeah, since Carol in the state, uh, in the uh, Senate. And so that's how he became, that's how his name got into, into, into the mix. Alexis so, Herman and Bill Lynch were also very yep. important in that uh, decision-making so, process. So it's, so it's safe to say that uh, President Barack Obama, he owes a whole lot of black folks, including y'all, for making that possible because that's what vaulted him on the national stage and paved the way for that 2008 run. I'm sure he would credit that. his talent and, and the people of Illinois who elected him, but we sisters here, we also believed in him and we wanted to see uh, this young politician move forward in American politics. And so we did uh, recommend him highly. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you this here? When you look at what's happening right now, um, Mainstream media, white folks, they were like, oh my God, look what happened in Alabama. Look what black black women did in Alabama. And black folks were going, uh, y'all late. <laughs> so this idea that like it was this newfangled thing that black women uh, were organizing and mobilizing and raising money and getting the vote out, for black folks, that wasn't a new story. Right. That, that's right. I, you know, for the last several cycles, it is an established fact that black women are the largest and most consistent voting bloc in the nation. We, mm -hmm. we investigate the candidates, we know what the issues are, and we show up and vote. And not only do we vote, we take people with us to vote. Mm -hmm. We spread the word. We are our own, uh, the, the modern day uh, version of the African drum. Mm -hmm. So all you got to do is give us the message and we believe in it, we will take people out. So you're absolutely right. This is not new. We've been carrying the nation on our back for many years, mm -hmm. decades, centuries, in fact. And it's less about us trying to save the nation than we're trying to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we save ourselves, we save our communities, and that in turn saves the nation. So this is not a new thing. I think what you see now is black women choosing to step even further in the forefront mm -hmm. by running for office. Stacey, Abraham, Stacey Abrams, Tish James, Lauren Underwood, Lucy McBath, the list goes on and on and on of black women who are saying, we're going to change this. It's not enough for us to vote. Mm -hmm. Now we're ready to lead in an out front electoral way. And so we're running for office and we're winning. Mm -hmm. What is your advice? No, I'll ask you this way. What can a young brother or a young sister who is interested 
in either running for office, who's interested in either working in politics uh, in an official capacity, whether it's for, for a politician or within the party, or even somebody who just wants to be engaged in the political process, what's the one thing, the most important thing they should learn from this book? Well, I think uh, I think it's actually two different questions because if you want to if you want to run for office, I would say that you want to prepare, and it's especially important for our candidates to prepare because one, they normally don't have the money; two, they have to almost convince their own people that they can win. We've seen that over and over again. But three, we want them to be have some staying power. So I would say they have to prepare, and that's something that I say to our candidates all the time with great joy: please prepare. And I think for people that just want to get involved in politics, I just say get involved as a volunteer. Right. That's how I started out. I started volunteering for Harold Washington's campaign, and I became his youth director. I had no idea what being a youth director was, but I knew that I wanted to be involved in politics, so I took myself down to his office every day and just volunteered. And then you have mentors like we had, and so they will help you swing the door open if they see that you're really committed to it and you have staying power. I also hope that what they will take from the book is our friendship, the, the fact that we've had each other's back, that we've been through a lot of campaigns, but not just political campaigns. Mm -hmm. I mean, standing together as we went up to the Capitol uh, for Rosa, Rosa Parks' line in state, uh, we were there because she was there for us. And, and so it's important that they also take away the story of our friendship, the story of our faith, and also the story of our our own resiliency. So I, I think those are important reminders in the book as well. What do y'all wish you knew then that you know now? Hmm. Well, Leah always, uh, <laughs> she, she's, a, she's, the, she's the preacher in the bunch, so I, I think she... <laughs> The bunch. <laughs> she, she's a preacher. I, I'm the center in need of preaching and some other things. You know, I, I think I, I wish I'd known when I was younger that uh, I wish I'd taken more chances. If I could talk back to my 20-year-old self, I'd say be brave. Mm -hmm. Be braver. You are stronger, smarter. Uh, than you think you are, mm -hmm. than you know you are. And so take some chances, step out there, push a little, I mean, I was already bossy, I'm the oldest of four. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't have a problem telling people what to do, but I, you know, I tried to temper that some when I was younger and I wish I hadn't, I should have, I wish I'd been a little uh, more strident in my youth. Uh, and and if, I, if I had any idea what I'd be able to achieve uh, at, uh, na I, I, I probably wouldn't have believed it, but you know that's how God works. He never shows you the whole picture because you go screaming into the night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I wish I, did, I wish I had. If I could talk back to my twenty-year-old, I said, "Be brave. Mm -hmm. You're smarter than you know." Yeah. Well, I would talk back to that that kid ten years ago, Roland when Barack Obama was elected. I think uh, I had no idea this country would uh, face such a severe backlash and we would go back to even a time that many of us never uh, saw as, as children growing up. Uh, we should have been better prepared in, yeah. in 2008 for what was to come after electing our first African-American president. Mm -hmm. So I would go back into that era to make sure that we, we could have put down some more structural, uh, what I call some structural pillars that could have helped us through this, uh, this period of disruption and chaos that we're now experiencing. And to add on to what Donna said, it's, it's I yes. think we just, um, we went to sleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, we were comfortable and happy. We had our president and, and you know, I guess everybody said, okay, you got your 40 acres and the mule, so <laughs> <laughs> this, this is it. <laughs> and we we got we got lazy, mm. and we didn't know what was going on in the rest in the rest of the country with other people. Well, I damn sure tried to remind some folks. Oh yeah, but, I know uh, you did. You <laughs> still <laughs> remind <laughs> the people, Roland. <laughs> you sure did. <laughs> well, and thank we you will, for your uh, la your leadership and your friendship. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. We'll keep pushing that. Last question uh, before I go to my panel, and it's very simple. There's somebody watching who is saying, okay. Before y'all, y'all done what y'all supposed to do, now get out of the way. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that when people say that 
let, let, let the next generation come in. There's no place for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I got that question um, this weekend when I was in uh, Texas. Uh, somebody asked me that question, and I made the point. I said, there's a place for young uh, and old. There's a place for middle age, younger age. Uh, but how would you answer that when people, when someone says, the four of you, y'all should just ride off into the sunset uh, and let somebody else do, uh, do the work? How would I you answer that? I say t to these young people, the leadership line is short. Get I don't know who's in your way. Just get in the line. If you don't want to get in line, lead the line. But I can assure you, if you just step out there, you will have your place, whatever that place you think it is. Just you, you worry about you. Let us worry about us. But you worry about you. And just and I also tell them to learn their history because if you learn your history, you won't be so quick to try to dismantle your history because we believe history is unbroken continuity. I believe in the Bank of Justice. You know, Roland, over the years that we've been attending conventions, I've been to every Democratic convention since 1984, we set up what we call the Bank of Justice. The Bank mm -hmm. of Justice was to allow anyone that we knew and didn't even know mm -hmm. to come and experience history. Mm -hmm. When Leah was in charge of those conventions, I would call her early in the morning and say, Leah, I need 20 tickets. And I didn't know where she came up. Mignon, I need 10. And then we would hustle and find more. Mm -hmm. Because we knew at the end of the day, somebody would show up without a ticket because they wanted to witness history. So I tell my, my young students mm -hmm. and I tell my friends, come on in, the Bank of Justice, we're still looking for more tellers. Mm -hmm. And I, I say, Roland, you know, the scripture says he calls the young because they're strong and he calls the old because they know the way. Mm -hmm. At this point in our, in our community and our people's history, we don't have anybody to waste. Mm -hmm. And we don't have mm -hmm. any time to waste. We don't have time to waste by moving people who know the way off the scene. Mm -hmm. And we don't have people to waste by saying that certain set of folks because of their age, because of their geography, are not valuable to our people's struggle for self-determination mm -hmm. and justice. Everybody needs to be at the table. We need all comers, all towns. If you're willing to work, come to the table. Let's go. Our mm -hmm. people have need. Our people have needs, and we mm -hmm. are in a position to help them for, be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I frankly, learn, I frankly learn as much from the young people as I think they learn from me. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really get, gather from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Roland, the other day I was called the OG. I had to turn around and ask Yolanda and Leah, what's an OG? <laughs> so I'm proud they called me an OG. I just and I was proud you know. I knew what an OG yeah, me was. Too. I still <laughs> tried to figure no, it out. Y'all got it wrong. They're supposed to call y'all OCG, old color girls. <laughs> well, we're OCGs. OCG, hashtag OCGs. Right. <laughs> y'all, the book is called For Color Girls Who Have Considered Politics. Uh, Donald Brazil, Yolanda Carraway, Leah Daughtry, and many y'all more. We certainly appreciate you being a Roller Martin on the filter. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you.